Hello, today we have with us Dr. Chandrakant Giri, a PhD from Georgetown University, United States of America, Washington DC. Dr. Chandrakant Giri has been a scientist for over a span of 45 years. He has a PhD degree in molecular genetics. He has been a tenure scientist at the Food and Drug Administration and National Institute of Health Sciences. He is currently doing a research on cancer genetics and infectious diseases caused by bacteria, virus and others. And also he is a practitioner of bhakti yoga tradition for a span of over 25 years. So Dr. Guri, we are very happy to welcome you to our talk show. I am very happy. Thank you so much for inviting me. So Dr. Giri, um, you know, you, also, you have a background of science, science in your life and then you also are practicing spirituality. Now usually, you know, for a lay, layman person, uh, usually science is somebody for people who do not believe in God. And at the same time, you have a background of a spirituality in bhakti yoga. So, how have you been able to connect that spirituality with your science background? background? Um, that is what the general conception, misconception among people have, uh, that science and spiritual, spirituality don't match. Uh, in a way, they are right, um, on the surface at least, uh, because science can only deal with material elements, it cannot deal with spirituality which is devoid of material elements. Um, but the research that I am proposing and the hypothesis uh, I am developing, hopefully uh, that will shed light and tells you that indeed science can deal with spirituality and the way that I'm proposing is that the any time we communicate, we as a spirit soul communicate with matter, for instance our physical body, which is when devoid of life, it's dull matter, devoid of life with the symptomatic life, the symptoms of life comes from being soul in the body. That's our scriptures says that. So when we try to communicate with our body, developing different kinds of emotions that would trigger some changes of material nature, so that material nature, material changes can now be detected by science. Just as I'll give you a, a, a very practical example, a, a computer programmer, how does he communicate with machine like computer? The only way can, computer can understand, a machine can understand only in its own language, its own lingo. And the computer program programs the computer in one of the computer language like Java and so on like that. It's alphabets, ones and zeros. So then you can say that the matter is spirit soul communicating with the computer. The same way here also I am proposing that when a spirit soul tries to communicate, it induces some chemical changes, some material changes. And that's what uh, what I call epigenetic changes. So I guess you want me to explain what is epigenetics? Yes, please. So what is epigenetics? Now, it may sound like a very complex uh, subject matter, uh, but I'll try my best to simplify without using too much of a science jargon. Epigenetic, what really means, as you know, genetics is a branch of biological sciences. And genetics, I think even a common person knows certain characteristics that we inherit from our parents. Don't the people say that, oh, he's after, gone after his mother, or he's, or she is like, is dead, you know. 
Uh, so that means certain characteristics are passed on from one generation to another generation. That is genetics. But epigenetics, the word epi really means something beyond, above. So genetics is really about the genes. Now people say this is right in your DNA. Which even common person knows what is DNA. So genes are there structurally, what scientists would like to call genotype. So this genotype, how it interacts with the environment, so genes are maintained structure, that means there is no mutation. However, the readout of the genes, the expression of the genes, that is altered change due to the environment and here the practice of spirituality, the very act of spirituality, uh, when you go to temple or you go to masjid or you go to church, just meditating on the Supreme God, you undergo several emotions, emotional experience leads to brain secreting some chemicals and that chemicals interact with the genome. Genome means the DNA is there, but in the cells, DNA do not exist as naked. It's always bound with specific kinds of proteins called histones, and that prevents its access to the DNA, readout of the genes. So this environmental changes for instance, um, when somebody breathes um, a contaminated air, polluted air, so cancer-causing chemicals gets into his bloodstream and that goes in the target tissues and affects the readout of specific, specific genes. For instance, cancer genes. That's the, uh, what a lot of uh, active years I spent on that doing research on cancer genes, such as tumor suppressor genes. So read out of this, expression of those genes is altered without change in the structure of these genes. So that is what we call epigenetics. You were just mentioning that, uh, in, you know, the cell is affected by the environment it has. Yes. And then you were talking about that the, uh, an environment of spirituality will affect the cell. Why only spirituality? An atheist who is exposed to an environment which is peaceful and calm, listens to good music, will the cell have a similar effect? Yes, atheist also. Do you have to have a faith in God? Uh, faith helps, but you don't have to have, because the process is so potent. You know, like, um, you know, just invoking the name of God is not different from God himself. So even our scripture says, that's not my words, Scripture says that even one jokingly invokes the names of God, it does reflect its potency. But with faith, if you chant the names, then it will have much greater potency. So you're saying I have to have faith in God. I don't have to but have faith. Faith, faith will, will help you. Faith will help. But it will not have the equal effect of me being an atheist and my cells are still going to be good if I am a spiritualist. When you say atheist, what we are talking about is selective gene expression. So one who may be atheist don't believe in God, environment will play a role like diseases and so on like that, even in atheist body. Okay. So depending on what kind of emotions he is going through that, he or she, Corresponding changes in his gene expression also will take place. Because he, atheists also have a certain kind of personality. As a one who is a practitioner of spirituality, we each have certain kinds of experiences, certain kinds of emotions. They all trigger appropriate cascade of reactions. So that is what I am talking about. But here when we, when we talk about spirituality, the reactions what we are talking about, all the genes 
that are specifically expressed turn on or even turn off that is specific to that particular process of spirituality. Now you may not even invoke the name of spirituality, but the act of doing that preaching, act of doing that spiritual practice, you just go to a temple and just behold the picture of God, you experience a great deal of peace, a great deal of happiness. Is that peace yeah. similar with a peace if I receive by going to the Himalayas and meditating? Yeah, uh, it, it's even expression of happiness or bliss will depend, we have different kinds of feelings. Like say for instance, you see uh, uh, your children, there is happiness. You see a relative coming to your home, you experience happiness there also. But can you say that's the same kind of happiness? So I'm talking about that. So when you see a behold, a picture of God, you are going to elicit a kind of feeling of bliss that is quite, that's out of this world. And scripture says, there is the kind of lasting peace. You really feel that kind of bliss. Sometimes it's very difficult to describe that you never experienced before. That is the kind of bliss I'm talking about. So that would elicit a different kinds of... Because we have... Um, I'm proposing that we have a set of genes that are specific to particular personality traits. Many of them, the science at this point, have not even identified. That remains to be identified. In fact, science says that we probably less than 5 or 10% of the genome that is expressed in what they call quote-unquote junk DNA. The rest of the 95% DNA they call junk DNA. I personally don't believe that. Because science, remember, we have a limitation of science. Science is great because that deals with experimental facts that could be experimentally verified, reproducibly. But at the same time, the limitation science has, because it's always evolving, depending upon the existing technology, and same, more often than not, when a new technology develops, the older concept, well established maybe, need to be refined. At times even have to be completely given up. So I'm talking about science is always evolving depending upon the existing technology. There are scriptures we are talking about that is top-down view. Everything is given because it is supposed to have been given straight from God. It's not man-made. It in Sanskrit term is called apavrusheya, alaukika, out of this world. So everything is given, but its realization is depends upon experience. So that's the fundamental difference between science and scriptures. And and our scriptures talks about not about life on this planet Earth. It takes about beyond the dimension of this Earth something that we are not even aware of and we are all dogmatized. We are kind of uh, conditioned by the life on this planet. I mean, very well-known example people give a frog in well, in a well. For that frog, that well is an ocean. That frog has no conception of real ocean or the vastness of that ocean. So he cannot even conceive. So that's a fundamental difference between scriptures and science. You also spoke about epigenetics, which is part of science, and you were explaining how the epigenetics is affected by spirituality. Yes. And you also spoke about uh, how there is junk DNA. Junk DNA, I would say, yeah. What, that, what the term scientists use. And that's again uh, a, a controversial topic, as I said, because many of the genes that we don't know that remains to be identified, 
so that concept I'm assuming that will change over time. Uh, in fact, my own research, microbiological research, I work with infectious diseases. Uh, we found genes within genes, genes within intergenic region, which people thought there are no genes. So you're saying in the d DNA there are genes, and within those genes there is. A there are there are specific genes are there, a well-defined gene, start and termination, well-defined genes, and functional gene. We found within that gene, another gene, it could be the same orientation or it could be opposite transcriptional orientation. And these genes, and also we, as I said, genes also we found between the two established genes, what they call junk DNA. So within junk DNA, so-called junk DNA, I'm putting quote unquote, okay, we found genes and the way we were able to identify those genes by special selection pressure under very specialized conditions. So we believe in a normal situation, these genes may not be expressed. So they are right, they, they, what they call junk DNA, there are no genes, they would say. But in highly specialized selection condition that we applied and we identified genes, so that's what I'm talking about. Because our existing knowledge about mapping those genes based on certain conditions. But sometimes a human faced with conditions that are totally different, that normally we may not experience or we may not even conceive of that, then you'll find some genes right there as we found. So that is what I'm talking about. Certain, yeah, we are talking about a human personality trait, certain kinds of emotions that an ordinary person may not experience. Those, like for instance, like we are talking about atheist. Now, I'm not criticizing atheist. I'm not saying, please, please understand that. But I'm talking about a, a, a devotee, a practitioner of spirituality, where he's deep in it, and the kind of emotions he's experiencing that may not be felt by folks on the other side, then he has no idea, what those feelings no, no are conception those of those emotions, emotions, because you have to experience yourself. And then those kind of emotions would trigger the expression of those genes, or even could shut off some of the genes and talk about that. So that might turn out to be in the so-called junk DNA. It's like, a, a, I would give a practical example. In a dense, dark jungle, there may be a well-traveled footpath. You're traveling all the time. But someone comes along and he says, I'm going to find a new path by myself. And he, in the beginning, he would have a hard time. But eventually, he might create a new path that people may not have conceived before. So I'm talking about that kind of thing. So, which may be, may be, yeah, maybe, maybe junk DNA is again the time dependent phenomena at this point. But maybe in the future when people will have find, found genes of specific traits that we don't know anything about today, then it would be no more junk DNA. As we reported just now, we found the genes within two established genes People thought it's not there, but the only way we could identify by applying selective conditions, selective pressure. So that is what I'm talking about. So science is always evolving, developing. So you can never say, uh, you know, you, you, you cannot, something that you, a negativity you cannot prove. Positive things you can always prove, but you say, no, it doesn't exist. How do you know that it doesn't exist? Can you prove something? Negative, you can't. You know, that's what I'm talking about. You spoke about uh, human personalities getting affected by the genes. Can yeah. you speak more about it as to uh, can I chemically do something to my genes that will inhibit certain human personalities? Say, suppose if I want to be a kind and caring person, can I do some chemical inhibitions to my gene where I could be a kind and caring person? Well, 
because you said it's coming from the environment environment effects makes an impact on that person's uh, uh, outlook and so on like that w w what i'm proposing what i'm talking about even it is still a hypothesis it but the hypothesis i'm putting forward uh, it's based on certain observations the it's centuries of observation that a person before he becomes a practitioner of spirituality he may have a certain kinds of undesirable traits a very obnoxious personality he becomes very angry over practically nothing that kind of personality i'm talking about even that kind of obnoxious personality by hook or crook or by some association by the association also plays a role uh, on the personality and becomes he is introduced to the practice of spirituality and lo and behold over time dramatic changes in his personality takes place and this is a solid observation over centuries and so many people history documents to that so that kind of observation i'm talking about so observation is there for which modern science has no viable explanation and here i'm proposing that there is indeed a, at least a potential is there that perhaps the genes encoding for those personality traits that are favorable in discharging a spiritual practice at the same time concurrently those genes that encode undesirable traits like i said becoming very angry cruel cruel nature no compassion those are the genes those are the traits are not very favorable when you want to become god conscious so those and your traits, other yeah, genes exactly. switch on like that you got it that's what i'm talking about because that is not favorable on the path of god being god conscious god as we know from scriptures is a all loving personality he loves everyone we are actually part and parcel of him but please remember because you might say that i am talking about a faith here but when i am proposing this hypothesis without invoking any scriptures even without invoking the concept of god what i am saying the act of that spiritual practice don't even name it spiritual just the act of spiritual you go to temple and just simply offering your obeisances that act of over offering obeisances listening to the sound vibration and you can filter it out ordinary sound vibration by conducting these experiments in a very well defined conditions and you will see specifically sound vibration names of god that will elicit a very different response that's what i'm talking about so you are you saying that just the act of spirituality whether it's going to the temple ringing bells exactly. eating prasad has nothing to do with your faith in god but if you're just doing these acts yeah that very act i'm talking about just the act is going to have exactly. effect on your genes exactly. yes. so i could be a complete atheist but i could be going to the temple yes. doing all this and it's still going to make me a good and kind good that person that act is very important but if you develop but see what happens that is the exactly my objective to motivate mass of people on the street to become god conscious there are many stories mind well that the stories in scriptures are not imaginary stories they are historical account really those personalities did exist it has been shown that even accidentally evoking the name of god even jokingly the potency worked 
and they are saved by the greatest danger. So potency is there. You may not have faith, but the act of that. However, by seeing the, its efficacy, you understand what I'm talking about? Efficacy. Efficacy means actually bringing in the results. So when a person begins to see a positive result, faith in his God. And then so just the, the practice itself exactly. will make you feel like there wonderful, is a person. Wonderful. Because the sense of accomplishment, when we have a sense of accomplishment, it will propel you forward with increased enthusiasm and then it will work cooperatively. More enthusiasm, more seeing the positive results, more that faith becomes developed and ultimately the, the faith is fixed and he is beginning to, going to see that, experience that. And not only that, he is going to relate his experience to his family members, his friends, and so on like that. So I'm talking about that. So that is the idea by scientifically proving the efficacy, the effectiveness of that practice itself, hoping that would promote God consciousness in the society and all the evils the chaotic nature that we see nowadays in the society that would likely disappear because people will realize the accountability what I commit these things is not good and the love for God will increase the love for the fellow beings the entire society that is going to be promoted there is to show the scientific validity of that. And I developed this hypothesis based on real observations. A plausibility factor was very important for me to propose that. At least I have these ideas which could be experimentally tested. Why not do that? Conduct, devise, develop a well-controlled scientific study. This is the very similar thing I'm talking about the yoga and meditation. Hypnosis, I can name many more. Just a few years, they were outside the realm, pressure, lower anxiety levels, and so many beneficial health effects. And when it was scientifically validated, more and more people started taking. So it's no surprising. Now, all major cities and towns around the world, the yoga centers are mushrooming. Meditation is becoming very popular. Practice of spirituality would become, it's like a diabetes patient. He can now measure sugar levels. When it goes beyond certain threshold, he knows he must take medicines, insulin and so on like that. The same way I envision, perhaps science may be able to develop genetic biomarkers of certain personality traits and he knows that if I practice this particular act of personality, I can develop desirable traits. At the same time, undesirable traits could be suppressed for good. Wouldn't that promote him? Wouldn't that motivate him more towards the path of spirituality? So you were mentioning about uh, diseases, how they are getting affected by uh, spirituality. So do you think that you know on your research on uh, cancer genetics and on infection diseases uh, can spirituality take over allopathic medicine i would say it's not just allopathic medicine uh, even the conventional medicine uh, they found uh, that when a patient uh, is more spiritually oriented or offering prayers a will to live that same medicine, same uh, you know, regimen mm -hmm. becomes much more effective relative to the one who is not doing these things, who has given up the hope. Because this spirituality gives the hope, will to live and will to... Even if people have, um, after having gone through that crisis in their life, uh, and, and then and then they see 
experience the positive effect thereafter their very broad outlook really changes changes for good and that is again an observation that is well documented uh, either conventional medicine or whatever the other medicines that you talk about. So you're saying that if I happen to have a disease and if I'm taking allopathic medicine and if I'm a practitioner of spirituality the same allopathic medicine which I'm taking would have a quicker effect uh, on my disease rather than if I'm not practicing spirituality and the allopathic medicine could take a longer time to heal my body? Uh, again, um, uh, I wouldn't specify just allopathic medicine, any kind of medicine, allopathic or even conventional, modern medicine. And, and same is true what I just said to you. Um, uh, this, uh, in fact, uh, many hospitals in the US, they have this uh, um, uh, kind of spiritual um, counseling. And if it helps patient, uh, they promote offering prayers and things like that. Uh, and, and you know, as long as it does help uh, their practice, medical practice, and if, if it's effective, uh, either not necessarily just prolonging the life, the end comes much more peaceful and much a humane way uh, when someone... Um, uh, is given this kind of spiritual counseling. Uh, that's a very documented observation. So, in, when you were talking about the human personality traits, um, in my own personal life, I've noticed that sometimes yeah. I'm forced to act in a certain way, you know. Uh, you know, it's like uh, I'm forced to get angry, you know, although I want to know, although I feel like I, I shouldn't be getting angry, you know. But sometimes I feel like I'm just forced to get angry. So, how can spirituality help me in that matter? I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, because there is an answer uh, in our scriptures. And perhaps we can validate or even document scientifically also. And this is, uh, it goes like that. That the material nature uh, is has three kinds of qualities basically and in reality it is the combination of these three qualities what we call uh, qualities of modes quality of goodness and quality of passion and quality uh, in sanskrit language is called sattva guna raja guna tamo guna so when you are in the mode of goodness uh, you really uh, tend to strive for the real knowledge. Uh, whereas, as opposed to Sattva Guna, where when you are under the influence of the lower modes, like the modes of passion, passion means really hankering incessantly uh, for material benefits. Ignorance is kind of lethargy, inertia. Uh, the the outer manifestation of these lower modes, our scriptures tells us that one develops these lusty desires, kam, krodh, lobh, mad, moha, matsara, the six enemies of the mind. So when you have lust, desire, and if you don't get fulfilled, uh, people become very angry. In case if it does fulfill, uh, then greed develops. They want more. And that further on leads to illusion, false pride. Um, so these are undesirable traits. And when you have that, the kind of body you possess with this kind of lower modes and this kind of six kinds of vices, the enemies of the mind, then even if he doesn't wish, he's forced to act the way you just described. Uh, and he does that. Um, and his inner voice tells him, don't do that. It's not good for you. The, what we call inner consciousness, inner voice. But the scriptures again tells that inner voice 
is that God situated in our heart. And now how do we really put it scientifically? So what I am proposing is that this different kinds of qualities of nature, these three basic qualities, the combination of that in different proportions which gives variety in varieties of shades, different kinds of bodily forms. Uh, it's very much like these three basic colors, mixing of that you can varieties of shades. So, so when you have these different qualities that will build different kinds of personality uh, and, and you can really demonstrate scientifically because these are all again for sattva guna, genes could be for rajaguna, genes for ignorance and again there will be varieties of uh, combinations. So I, I being a molecular geneticist, uh, I could visualize, I could really conceptualize that there could be uh, 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 a fine tuning of its expression levels due to the environment. That means the very act of spirituality that person is practicing that would affect that and then the genes that encoding for the mode of goodness that is likely to be expressed selectively there's genes that is encoding for those undesirable traits due to this lower qualities of material nature rajaguna and tamaguna more of passion and ignorance you would see, I would envision, conceptualize again, that there's, those genes are selectively going to be turned off as you make progress on the devotional path. So, that is what uh, I'm, I'm talking about, you know. That what, I, I, I think I'm answering your question, I hope. You were also talking about, uh, you know, that there is a gene of mode of goodness, yeah. mode of passion, mode of ignorance. Like, uh, so is it that it is inherent? I, or is it that I can develop a mode of goodness gene in myself? Now again, let me let me make it very clear here for our audience here. Uh, so far, it's not been demonstrated yet. No, it's not been found. Let's put it this way: one has to look for it. And these studies, this this theory I'm proposing, uh, there is a good potential that one could uh, one outcome of this study could be that. So there could be that genes. we do have a gene of more yeah, than good. Exactly. So am I inherently do I have that gene? Yeah. Or do I can develop that gene of more of goodness, no, passion. No, again, the, what epigenetics says, we have all these genes arrayed linearly on the on this thread of DNA. Okay. DNA is six foot long, okay. as I told you that it's a, a two meter long DNA. It's highly compacted in a cell nucleus. And that's by the proteins, and that would restrict its accessibility. So the gene itself is not changed. Gene is there. Okay. All these genes of different qualities. There might be not one gene, might be varieties of genes of different shades of modes of goodness or the passion. Passion, ignorance. ignorance. Okay. So they are, they are already there. What I believe is that will show up in this junk DNA so-called junk DNA. Okay, so right now the scientists are not looking in junk DNA and you believe yes. that this mode of goodness, passion and ignorance, mm. uh, I believe the gene exists yes. in the junk DNA. Yes, uh, because uh, the way they, as to my understanding, the way they come to that, um, you know, there are 22,000 genes are there by sequencing the entire genome because the pattern uh, looking at the conventionally based on what they know now here's the stop site of the gene based on that they did so scientifically what they call open reading frame based on that actually they determined that 22,000 genes but we found the same kind of open reading frame where they thought there are no there are no genes because we applied selective pressure so that is what I'm talking about in, in a situation how much of more of goodness they have that so far we're not faced in, in a particular, um, you know, let's say practice of devotional service, spirituality, they might find these genes. Uh, and, and if they do, there's a, there's a good chance 
uh, we can develop genetic biomarkers and we can monitor the person's you know how much of you, yes how they develop as a function of that person practicing spiritual uh, practices you know so are you seeing a person who is uh, on a very high level of spirituality who has uh, who is practicing spiritual spirituality for a long time yes um, especially I'm talking about the yogis in the Himalayas yes like so they do have genes of mode of goodness in them is that what you're seeing they have more of that mode of goodness genes in them um, no not necessarily yogis because <laughs> you know many times yogis they do for self selfish interest also they want to develop a certain kind of siddhis being able to you know compact their body. So you see that this uh, incredible, this yogic uh, exhibitions, then where the yogi uh, tries to fix in a very compact surface or they do uncommon things, walking on the fire and things like that. I'm not talking about those yogis. I'm talking about those yogis who aspire. The word yoga means to link. Sanskrit word yoga means to link. The original purpose of yoga and meditation is to link with the Supreme. Not just health benefits or some specific kinds of siddhis, specific kinds of being able to do superhuman acts. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? So that's not a spiritual practice. Yes. So one has to very clearly have a good, con a clear conception what is spiritual practice. We are not talking about any selfish, self-centered interest. We are talking about linking with the Supreme. Those are the practices which I am talking about. Those are the practices which brings in this epigenetic changes that I am talking about. Again, I am theorizing all this thing. Um, you know, I am not saying those genes are there because they are not yet found. They remains to be found. And they one has to really consciously looking for that. Unless you are consciously looking for that, how you are going to find? Like my own research said that. I was looking for those things and I found that because uh, the way I carried out those experiments. So this is what I am saying that uh, in, in a situation, uh, a, a person never faced himself in that condition or in that situation. And then you'll find those genes. That's what I'm talking about. So those those three qualities of nature, goodness, passion, ignorance. So it is the passion and ignorance that motivate that that promotes him to pursue this self-interest, self-centered interest, mad, mad hankering in pursuits of material happiness. And, and material happiness is not real in this world. You know, otherwise you just see that if if a person wants to become, let the person becomes billionaire, are all billionaires are happy? None of them are happy, really. Look at the the great powerful pers personalities, presidents, prime ministers, kings. They are not happy either. And if if you talk about, uh, you know, the great fame, no matter how famous famous personality you can become you still have a problem. So that's not the real happiness I'm talking about. The real bliss, happiness, comes from acquiring that material body purely in this mode of goodness. And our Shastra, our scriptures, tells us that these three modes have been constant flux mode of goodness, passion, ignorance, constant flux. Goodness can degrade into the lower modes. Lower modes can be promoted in the goodness depending upon what he is doing. Whenever a person does spiritual practice, uh, he tends to be in the mode of goodness. So here is what I would recommend. If you really want to be in the mode of goodness, which is a desirable trait, which will give desirable qualities, by constantly staying in spiritual practice. 
you could you could be doing any kind of material activities and you could still be in the spiritual consciousness because constantly your mind is fixed in spiritual pursuit instead of promoting your self centered interest now do you see the 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 the, the positive outcome in human society because when 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 person pursues madly in self centered interest that is that's what you see all this uh, you know unfair competitions unfair exploitation of those who don't have that these are all these kinds can be really taken care of that by spiritual practice is that the side benefits of that could this uh, genes of more of goodness passion ignorance which you plan to theorize could they be hereditary yes <clears throat> because like these are in the genetically encoded i believe <clears throat> and that is carried on one generation to next generation so that is there genes are there but its expression levels subject to modulation by the environmental condition what we call epigenetic changes and formation of epigenomes the epigenomes is the where this uh, modified modifications are there the chemical tags are attached to it uh, so it is a satellite genome so it is a satellite genome uh, uh, so that is what this environment would do that you know so you're saying that if i happen to be a spiritual person i can expect my children also to take up to spirituality quickly is that so let me put it this way if you're born in a spiritually oriented family you are going to get facilitated you're going to provide that uh, uh, that kind of situation conditions that would promote you towards getting spiritual like for instance uh, if a father is an engineer his son will right from his childhood would be exposed to that comes because his father will ask him to make some toys by himself airplane ships and things like that so he will be exposed to that kind of favorable situation condition and he will develop more likely uh, that kind of aptitude so when he applies when he grows up goes to college and uh, and applies for engineering school admission uh, he would he would show a pretty good aptitude you know but that doesn't necessarily mean just because he's born as a son of an engineer that he's going to be able to practice engineering unless he himself goes to engineering school and studies so you have developed you have uh, that those genes you inherit but you still have to work you on you have to work you so that's an important element remember i was telling you but the desirable trait you must have in the mode of goodness rather than passion and ignorance uh, the important element in there if you don't have it naturally then you want to practice it spiritual practice so there you can cultivate those qualities so you have to engage that's a very very important element uh, our scriptures teaches us the three three elements of practice when you don't have a natural affinity for becoming god conscious you can cultivate by practice that's the beauty part of it all right uh, so so that is what we call uh, you know spirituality and practice and there are three basic elements of that practice you have to engage your body your bodily senses eyes ears nose tongue skin and so on like that there are 10 senses and the mind all you have to engage them in the spiritual practice so you gonna have to purify quote and quote purify what 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 do, what do i mean by purification converting from the mode of passion to ignorance passion ignorance to mode of goodness ignorance to passion to goodness yes okay in a, in a, in a, there is a hierarchy in a there is a hierarchy goodness passion and ignorance ignorance is the worst thing so you have to do the spiritual practice to come to the mode of goodness
so that will promote that those genes which are encoded for the that mode of goodness they are going to be selectively turned on genes for all three modes are there but the genes for goodness goodness will turn on are turned on the genes for modes of ignorance passion they are turned off by the potency of the spiritual spirituality so you have to have engage your body and senses that's one thing the second important element how do you practice you must practice not some kind of uh, whimsically but you must practice according to the injunctions the scriptures mention bona fide scriptures and third element you need a spiritual guide just like you go to a professional school medical school engineering school law school you need textbooks which is a step higher than material bona fide textbooks and you need bona fide professors right so here also same thing you need this so these three elements are must be there then you develop a pure mode of goodness that does not degrade material mode of goodness degrades but when you develop pure mode of goodness which is a step higher than which material must goodness step higher than the material mode of goodness okay material mode of goodness is like material piety they are good that is desirable all right because the mode of goodness facilitates striving for true knowledge and only through mode of goodness you can get realization of the god god realization if you want to have you again i'm quoting shastras that's what you need and there may be a way to test experimentally exactly the protocol that i'm talking about that you can do that uh, at least potential is there so when you do that and you there's a great potency reality that you may be able to develop biomarkers genetic biomarkers of this basic modes remember at any given time no modes exist purely it's always a flux so you want to get out of this we say so you want to get out of that and develop spiritual mode of goodness and that is what really ought to be our goal so what does food uh, does food has to play a role oh very or important. just is just the environment no no food how about meat can i be no. can i still eat meat and uh, but if i can live a life of goodness can i still have a very a good, good question meat? very 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 good question um again shastra says that uh, food plays a very important role and food is not different from environment it is part of environment when we say environment that which is genetically inherited and that which is to the influence of your surroundings in fact people say that what you are what you eat what you are what the kind of company you keep these are all factors of environment so if you if you and 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 it is it is observed that when you eat um uh, uh food that's very pungent or spicy that affects the person's nature personality um you know uh, certain foods are very erotic it's that there are uh, aphrodisiac what they say uh, and that's a proven observ- proven fact uh, certain foods are like that you you don't want to eat that which is promotes that kind of after effects you want to eat that kind of food which is called satvik which promotes spirituality in you so meat right. doesn't falls in that category so meat um again this is the i don't want to get into that kind of um one don't want to give you um that kind of impression uh because this is a what called politically correct or not uh but what i want to say even medically it is proven when you one one consumes red meat it's a proven fact that person is susceptible to develop colon cancer meat eating is not very good for health 
So is it just the red meat? It's a medically proven fact, you know. But maybe it's just the red meat. Uh, well, that kind of cancers, but that doesn't mean that uh, white meat uh, is free from all kinds of things. So meat eating, when you talk about spirituality, okay, forget about the the ethics and thing, mora morality and things like that. I don't want to get into that kind of subject, uh, that kind of topics. Uh, but when you talk about spirituality, what Shastra says, when you eat this kind of food, the person is likely to develop uh, I'm very hesitant to use this word, but um, violent nature because meat because vegetables also plant also has life so the violent nature i mean is is happening outside I'm eating that meat, so is it affecting my genes so that I'm becoming more violent no again, listen. Uh, all these hypotheses, I'm talking about still a theory, hypothesis. But the nature, scripture says that. And scriptures, sattvic food we are talking about. Sattvic food do not promote eating meats, meat, or even vegetarian food like eating onions, garlic. Because those are, those aphrodisiac and that kind of in nature uh, and, and, and that kind of tendency uh, are detrimental in spiritual practice. Again, these are not my words. I am quoting Shastra and Bhagavad Gita is known throughout the world and Bhagavad Gita itself tells us uh, in the 14th chapter of Bhagavad Gita that certain kinds of foods are in the mode of goodness, certain kinds of foods are in the mode of passion, and so it goes with ignorance also. So from that, I theorize that there might be specific genes might be there that might be susceptible to eating, consuming that kind of food. So that's what I'm talking about. So you're so, saying that if I'm eating meat, which is falling in the category of mode of ignorance, that's passion, what ignorance. that's what you're saying. That's your what I'm not saying, but, say. the, but the scriptures. Yeah, says the that. scriptures are saying. Yes. So you're saying that gene it gets affected or it gets uh, and, arisen and, and, or and wake medically up. also. In the U.S., this they promote eat more vegetables, leafy vegetables. You promote more that. Uh, that's good for your health. That's uh, that's a proven fact that says that you know. Um, so we are not talking about morality and all kind of things. You're just talking about the gene level really that you will have a good benefits. Bed. And, yeah. But if you uh, we are indeed talking about promoting spirituality, so if you want to promote spirituality, uh, it's much better uh, to follow those guidelines, those recommendations. For a person who aspires to be spiritualist, uh, to follow and and be conscious, what kind of food he eats, and certain kind of food, uh, milk is the best kind of food actually, nutrient wise and everything. But you can't subsist. Uh, I'm not saying that you just drink milk and that's it. Vegetarian vegetarian food is good. So there, people ask, doesn't plant have life in it, and you are uh, killing the life to eat vegetarian plant food, plant based food and that's the reason our scriptures also says very nicely and the great sages they say that whatever the food you eat you must offer first to God and the remnants that you take what is called prasadam literally it means mercy of the God now, one may argue, why don't I eat meat? First, I offer the meat to God, then I'll eat that. But God says very clearly, Patram, Pushpam, Phalam, Toyam. So, only certain kind of food that can be offered to God. And that is true even the monks, they would not eat meat. Chinese monks, Japanese monks, they would not eat monks. So, the, what does it say that? 
because those are in the spiritual pursuit, they follow a particular guidelines. So I did not want to get into that kind of subject matter, but in so far as we are speaking about spirituality, spirituality recommends that we must eat certain kind of food, we must avoid certain other kinds of food that are detrimental, that are not uh, favorable on the path of spirituality. So it depends on what's your goal. If your goal is to become spiritual, then I would say you must follow that go those guidelines. So purely from that perspective, I am saying that. Okay, uh, uh, I did not want to get into that controversy uh, about meat eating and being uh, tendency to become more violent nature and everything. I am simply quoting that is what it says in the scriptures. So, Dr. Giri, what message would you have for our young budding scientist? The younger generation is our future. And um, what we just talked about, I want to let it go in the next generation, promote for the future. So, I am trying to motivate younger generation to take up science and see if they can connect with spirituality. Uh, and that's why I call synergy. Synergy means best of these two, you know. So, synergy means one plus one is, is more than two. So, that is what I, I want to gener younger generation to take it up. Uh, and one nice thing about that I noticed, the younger generation, today's youth, even little children, they are much better informed. Um, much sharper, you know, uh, because of the great uh, information flow, you know, internet technology and everything is there, um, as opposed to when I was growing up, you know. Uh, so that is what I like to promote younger generation, um, really ask some probing questions, uh, really become uh, very, very uh, interested to promote God consciousness, what I am talking about, uh, spiritual practice. Uh, becomes a much better person. Uh, I like to say that like uh, we are all human, but we should be humane. That is what, so I want to send this message to younger generation. Uh, so I am trying to ensure this message does not end with this generation, it goes in the next generation. Thank you so much Dr. Giri for being with us on this my talk pleasure. show. Thank you. I my hope you have learned I a lot. I enjoyed. I enjoyed. Thank you very much. Good luck. <laughs>